SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. So today I'm excited to introduce to you Sergeant Ryan Dura. He's with the Lethbridge Police Service Downtown Policing Unit. He's in his 21st year of policing and with bulk of his career being on the front line. He spent his first five years on the street in parole division, then in special operations unit, it morphed into alert, patrol again, intel section, and then the downtown policing unit. Today he's going to speak to us on what are the current status of the Lethbridge drug crisis. So please welcome me and uh, welcoming Ryan. Thank you. No, I think that should be good. I'll get the mic. I always say it's in the adult position because I always say I'm the normal size one and everyone else is short. <laughs> so, uh, like she said, hello, my name is Ryan Dara. I'm the sergeant in charge of our downtown policing units uh, where I have been in command of for about the last year and a half. And uh, I take great ownership in our downtown. I've given this presentation to a, a wide variety of different groups and people. And when I do this presentation, it can be a little bit rough. And when I say rough, I mean there's a little honesty in this. There's a lot of not great things that are happening to people in Western society because of our drug crisis. Uh, some amazing people are losing their lives every single day. Um, so in reference to that, a lot of my young police officers that I work with are going and dealing with a lot of these sudden deaths in public places in residence and stuff. Uh, then these are young police officers who signed up to be police officers who feel more like morticians lately. So they spend a lot of time with some dead people. So if I'm diminishing death in any way, please do not think that that is a disrespect towards anyone, because uh, I don't mean to come across like that at all. We just deal with it a lot, like daily. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a normal thing for us, which is, I think, in my soul, wrong, right? Because we shouldn't have to be dealing with, with this much death. Um, so yeah. That's my speech. Is anybody easily offended? <laughs> okay, if you, if, oh, oh, you might have to leave. I, I'm kidding, of course, I'm kidding. Um, if anybody is offended or if you found something that I said was a little bit out of line when referencing our drug crisis, uh, I'm more than willing to have a real and honest conversation with you after. Uh, I'm a police officer and I'm not gonna lie to anyone about what's really happening in our community, so. Okay, we'll start here. <clears throat> Uh, the lovely city of Lethbridge, we have two drugs which have totally taken over um, our drug crisis. We have stimulants, which I always played up like we go like this. This means a stimulant, whereas a depressant goes down. So it slows a person's a respiratory system down, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. But those, these two drugs, being methamphetamine and fentanyl, have totally taken over. Uh, I make the joke that... Uh, I miss the days of crack cocaine and rye whiskey. Uh, when I first started being a police officer, cocaine was a problem. Uh, a lot of heavy drinking was a problem, especially in our downtown core. We would arrest people for being intoxicated in a public place. We would put them in the, the, the van, and we'd take them to the drunk tank. Uh, number one, the drunk tank doesn't exist anymore, and the number of people that we take to or in, take into custody for being intoxicated is maybe a couple a week, maybe at best. Uh, alcohol just doesn't play that big of a role in our downtown core, and that's because methamphetamine and fentanyl have taken over. God bless my drinkers, there's about six of them, and they're fantastic people. They may sit in the park and have a few beverages during the day, but uh, they don't cause us a whole lot of problems, and they're usually pretty cheerful. So uh, they have a special place in my heart. So. Doesn't mean that what, just because they're publicly drinking that I'm condoning what they're doing, I'm not saying that, but I have much, much bigger problems, so. <laughs> stimulants, <clears throat> this is the one that goes up. This is like, cocaine is a stimulant which increases your heart rates, increases your, uh, your breath rates, your stimuli. Methamphetamine is the king of stimulants. It makes things go way faster. Uh, when meth first hit the city of Lethbridge, it was expensive. 
Now we're down to in the downtown core that you can get a hit of meth for four dollars. So that's a 0.1 gram portion. So uh, methamphetamine uh, leads to restless hyperactivity, twitching, tremors, numbness, repetitive and obsessive behaviors, dilated pupils, dry mouth, dry and or itchy skin, blood pressure changes and increased body, body temperature. Uh, if you're seeing somebody, if you're seeing somebody in a downtown core or out in our city that's moving quickly or flailing their arms around, uh, which is a common term within the policing world now of flailing, uh, they're most likely using a stimulant being methamphetamine. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. A quick one, yeah. I see people bent over, like, like just like that. Just like that for half an hour. We, we will 100% come and talk to that as the presentation goes on. Yeah, I'm not asking any questions anymore. Thank you. We just need the questions for the mic for the recording, so after the fact. Okay. So methamphetamine sells by the points, so a 0.1 gram portion, which is very, very small. So that is, there's 10 points, so 0.1 portions in a gram, and a gram is very small. So they take meth, uh, it's sold by the point of 0.1 gram, you can buy it for four bucks. You can get a gram of it, which is 10 doses, for about 15, 20 dollars nowadays. So that would, one point would probably make me high for 18 hours, and I would be out of my mind. So obviously the tolerance level is a little bit higher for a lot of our repetitive drug users, but for methamphetamine, that's, that's honestly the biggest problem is just the cost. It is so cheap that a lot of my drinkers moved over to methamphetamine because it is just such a cheap drug. Alcohol still is relatively expensive. Like even if you're drinking uh, a bottle of white lightning vodka, it's still gonna cost you, you know, twenty-two dollars, right? So there is a cost associated to that. <coughs> methamphetamine consumption. So there's a bit of a misconception in our city that there's needles everywhere. And 100% that was true in about 2016, 17, 18, 19, especially during the height of our supervised consumption site. We saw thousands, like I think the top number was 66,000 needles went out in one month. That is 100% not the case anymore. We do not see a whole lot of needles being used in public. I'm not saying it does not happen, but if you were saying that there are a lot of needles around the city of Lethbridge, you were not here in 2018. That's kind of how I explain that. Um, it is maybe 2% of what we had back uh, a few years ago. So they are still around and there are special procedures for uh, clean sweep and the watch will come and pick up the needle debris being the needles on the ground and the little bowls that go with them. But the primary way that people are consuming methamphetamine now is smoking. So there's a special pipe. It is a long glass tube with a bulb on the butt on the end of it, and they put methamphetamine inside that. They light it up with a butane torch and they inhale it. It is a quick and easy way to get methamphetamine into their system because they inhale it. If they were to use needles, they have to mix it up, they have to warm it up, they have to dilute it because methamphetamine is a, a crystal kind of rock it dissolves in water and they inject it into themselves. It takes time and it's a little bit dirtier. And a lot of our at-risk population don't want to go through that. So you can also orally take methamphetamine. You can eat it. Uh, it's not very efficient. That would just almost like an alcohol. It goes into their stomach, but it doesn't work very well to get put into the blood system. Uh, you can also snort it. We see a little bit of that. You can crush it up almost like a powder and snort it, but that's very rare. We don't see that with our population for the most part. <clears throat> and that right there is kind of what a meth pipe looks like. That is the bubble, and you can see the kind of the white residue. When you burn methamphetamine, it has that kind of white smoke or film that builds on the inside of the bubble. So it's very specific to methamphetamine. We talk about kind of the, 
uh, the common occurrences are what we're seeing downtown. Uh, in that image right there in the middle, you can see some tinfoil packages. And those are points or portions of methamphetamine that are pre-packaged. So this was a drug dealer that we arrested in Gall Gardens. And this is what he had on him. So he has some bear spray to the left. He has a smaller bear spray. I don't know what it is, but everyone loves to use bear spray because it's readily available. Uh, it's a quick, easy weapon to spray someone in the face with. Uh, that's more of our drug dealers or drug users spraying each other. Uh, there's some cash there, a digital scale. That is an airsoft handgun in the middle, and which is a common occurrence. We are probably taking one of those off the street here in Lethbridge every day to every two days. Uh, when I started this career, that was a very rare occurrence. We didn't really come across um, airsoft handguns, um, but they are an everyday occurrence. Uh, I don't know how, but we have not had an officer involved shooting with one of those within our city yet. There's been multiple occurrences where people have pulled them out in front of our officers, including myself, and pointed them at some of us, uh, and we have not shot them, which is, uh, I think at this point, a miracle, um, which I take great pride in that, and I think our guys have done, our guys and girls have made some great choices when they're presented with those weapons. So when it comes to firearms, uh, we, we're, we're probably picking one off on the street once or twice a week now, which is also very rare. It's just becoming more prevalent. Um, and most of those firearms are like altered hunting rifles. Uh, we don't see a ton of handguns uh, within our downtown core population. There are more guns that are stolen from someone's residence during a break and enter or from someone's vehicle during hunting season. So. Um, and then on the bottom is a machete. There's a couple of machetes there. I don't know what is about machetes, but everybody loves them downtown. So when I talk about our downtown population having weapons, it's they have them to protect themselves from bad people doing things to them. They don't have them for primary use of going out there and hurting any one of us. They use them as defensive weapons to protect themselves. Uh, every I've dealt with a lot of at-risk people and had some very negative interactions with them. Um, I am yet to be stabbed, so that's a good thing. So that was a quick blast through methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is a stimulant, so it makes you go faster up higher, right? Uh, the main drug that gets a lot of press is now where we're getting into, which is which are opiates. So depressants being oxycodone, oxycontin, heroin, fentanyl, carfentanil, and morphine. Opiates cause the loss of a lot of lives across Western Canada. Uh, it's super frustrating. A lot of really good people have died. Um, and when you're using fentanyl, there is no, uh, it's a street drug, which is manufactured in labs in uh, Mexico, in China. Uh, and you used to be able to buy it online and it would come to your residence like you buy on the black market and then you mix it with a bunch of other buffing agents like to add more weight to it like flour when you're making cookies and uh, then they sell it on the street in, in 0.1 gram portions there's no quality control for this stuff like when you buy prescription medication there's a weighed amount of active ingredients in that prescribed amount that you're receiving they do not have that when it comes to street drugs. So fentanyl, there can be you know, one or two flakes of fentanyl in that pill or that portion, or there could be 10. So you really don't know what you're getting. And that's where we have the overdoses, especially by people who are using these evil drugs by themselves. Uh, they may have used for the past year and everything has been fine. And then they take one dose, which is extra strong, and they're by themselves. And they go into respiratory failure and unfortunately they pass away. So. There's some, there's some terrible stories that go along with that, uh, events that have happened right here in our own community. Uh, when it comes to the impact of the human body, uh, when a person uses opiates, the chemicals of the drug hijack the natural opiate receptors in the central nervous system and the brain replace that dopamine with synthetic dopamine. That's like the, the pleasure drug within our bodies. Uh, suddenly that person feels happy and experiences a sudden rush of ease, well-being, and euphoria. Uh, that number, that first high that they get is always the best high. And they spend the rest of their addiction process 
journey trying to get back to that level. And opiate uh, abuse, as opiate abuse continues, the brain stops producing natural dopamine because there's so much dopamine present in the body already. Uh, and this is just the layman's explanation of this. If there's any medical facility or me medical people in the room, you can probably describe this better than I can. So. Signs of impairment. Like we, the first question there, the, the, the slumped over, you see a lot of this. Um, it's been referenced as like the, the zombie stance, anything like that, uh, slumped over in an unnatural position. People ask me all the time, why do they get kind of bent out of shape or do they, do they appear to be abnormal or have a, an odd cadence to their walk? And I always compare it to, imagine, I'm old, I feel, and if I sleep on my pillow wrong, my neck hurts in the morning. Can you imagine not drinking water for two days sleeping on the cold pavement uh, at an odd angle because you fell asleep while using drugs and your body muscles are now contorted in that direction and then waking up and trying to walk. Uh, you compound that by days, weeks, or months of behavior in the same way and it really impacts the human body. So that's kind of where that behavior and the, the, the zombie and or weird walk comes from. And this population, they're not going to the chiropractor or making sure that they're taking, you know, extra medication to, to ease their muscle pain. For people who are in that kind of overdose or nod stage, if you use too much fentanyl, you can kind of fall asleep, which we call the nod. Uh, the skin may be a little bit uh, clammy, uh, you might get blue lips, blue fingers, fingernails, inability to communicate effectively, they might be really slow or just literally be falling asleep while you're talking to them or even in a very, you know, agitated situation, they are completely, you know, unresponsive. Uh, shallow breathing or no breathing, it's amazing sometimes when my brothers and sisters from EMS show up uh, and they'll check their blood oxygen level of a person, it can be down to like 15, 20%. Um, we give them Narcan and do CPR and it comes right back, so. And the heart rate can slow right down. Basically your brain is telling your lungs to stop working when they get into an overdose state. So the rest of the body is all in perfect working condition. You just stop breathing. So uh, they basically suffocate, which is super sad. Uh, this is when fentanyl was quite prevalent starting in 2018, 19. These pills were the main thing. They were kind of pushed out into the media as this is the, the form that fentanyl came in. I have not seen green fentanyl pills or fentanyl in a pill form for probably three years at this point. Uh, it's changed a little bit, but this is kind of how it started and that's how it looked. They, people would, for the most part, take those orally or they would take that pill and dissolve it in water and inject it in a needle, which was part of our big needle push in 2018-19. That's kind of what they used to look like. That is, you can see the green needles there and those green, um, pills would be drawn into those needles and people would inject that into themselves. Those are images of what fentanyl looks like today on the street. It's a granular colored substance. A lot of our drug dealers like to kind of brand themselves. I'm not saying like a Chevy or a, a Cadillac or a Ford, but if it's a certain color with a lot of the users, they know that maybe the pink stuff is really popular. Right now in our city, as of like yesterday, the yellow stuff is supposed to be really popular and really strong. When we talk about drug users, they want the most value for their dollar still. So when they're buying fentanyl in a 0.1 gram portion of say 20 bucks, they want the strongest drug they can get. So the yellow stuff is quite popular right now. And that's what it looks like. It's just, it comes in a, a small package like that, as you can see on the top. Uh, and it's just a granular, colored substance. So it almost, I explain it as it can look like, a, like chunks of a cookie batter or a broken crayon as it kind of gets a little bit thicker. <clears throat> so the big push to get away from needles was the education piece that was done through kind of some of our harm reduction partners that it's a little bit safer to smoke fentanyl and methamphetamine. That's where the big push came to use the bubble pipes. 
And currently a lot of people will use, uh, in this image you can see that glass pipe in the middle, that's called a straight shooter. They'll put fentanyl on a piece of tin foil and light the bottom of it, which heat, heats it up, turns it into a smoke, and then they inhale it through the pipe. Uh, if you come across these in your backyard, if someone you know, was, was there without your consent, or in a back alley or around kids or in a playground, please don't touch it uh, and contact uh, Clean Sweep or the watch and they'll come and clean that stuff up. So there can be some residue of fentanyl on those pieces. So that's just a safety part of that. So. And once again, fentanyl is sold at roughly at this point, 20 bucks. The cost has come down a little bit since I, I updated this PowerPoint for a 0.1 gram portion, which is once again, there's 10 points in a gram. So it's a very small amount for $20. And those are some other pictures. On the left there, you can kind of see the color and the consistency of it. It's, it just looks like chunks of crayon. So they, they've basically taken a, a green batch and a yellow batch and they've mixed them together for sale purposes. That's a common look of what a fentanyl pipe looks like. Fentanyl pipes have black residue, whereas methamphetamine have that white. So you can see that the blackness inside there, um, I should probably be wearing gloves when I'm touching that, but. And just some other images of what it looks like with uh, some larger seizures. Those are some seizures we've had within our downtown core. A couple of several, several ounces. This is from a larger scale dealer on the left hand side. And then the right hand side was a half a kilogram of fentanyl, which was a gentleman right in behind the coal banks on five streets uh, just before Christmas in 2022. So. Once again, that's just an everyday occurrence. The airsoft guns, uh, knives, uh, the top little vial there, those are just the airsoft bullets, like um, pellet gun bullets. This graph here is taken from the Alberta Health Services website. So this is an open source that anybody can access that expresses where we're at for our opioid deaths across the province of Alberta. It breaks it down into zones and or cities. And like I said, this is publicly available information. So that's where this is coming from. Uh, if you can look at the top graph, it's kind of hard to see, but there is a number of, the top number is 50. And that is the overdose rates for the entire province, okay? So that just lets you understand how skewed this is. And if you look at the bottom, the numbers go up to, 200. So the bottom is Lethbridge and the top is the provincial average. So the provincial average of deaths per 100,000 people is about 34. Uh, at one point in 2023, back in March, we were up to 240 per 100,000 people. So uh, our current rate is about 58 deaths for 100,000 people going back to November of 2024. So that's, the stats are a little bit dated, but that's kind of where the literacy trends are. So they haven't put out the new numbers for where we're at coming into 2024. But, yeah. Some of the challenges we deal with downtown are just our drug traffickers come downtown and offer drugs to our average population uh, at they target them. They know when people are getting paid, uh, when government checks come through, H, that kind of stuff, they'll target the shelter, they'll target golf gardens, they'll target it, busy areas where people are hanging out, which is super frustrating. Uh, we try and deploy some of our resources at the same time, try and uh, put some covert units like um, our undercover operators or covert surveillance units to kind of watch those drug dealers at those times. And that's along with a hopefully a greater police officer presence in uniform. So um, drug addiction, or sorry, drug addiction and abuse with drug use comes some violence, whether that's drug users on drug users uh, or property crimes that take place, a lot of our personal crimes, robberies, crimes against person, 
break and enters into people's houses in the middle of the day. Like when these people are using these drugs, they take risks that are way higher than they usually would. So. Uh, and once again, mentioning the high rate of overdoses is often fatal and the LPS and EMS repeatedly involved with many of the same people. Uh, my downtown population is about 220 living at the shelter uh, and I deal with the same about 80 people 95% of my time, so. What we're trying to do is uh, increase visibility and capacity with our downtown police unit. You know, we're trying to get more members. Uh, we're trying to hire more police officers. If you know any awesome people in your family, we are hiring like crazy. We're doing a recruit class every January and July. So if you know anybody, send them our way. Uh, we are desperate. Uh, and we, we partner with the city of Lethbridge and the BRZ to kind of share more information to get out there kind of what's happening, what people can do to be safer, as well as our encampment strategy. We've had some success in 2023. We're hoping to carry that into 2024. And that's kind of my message is I have a zero tolerance for encampment stuff. Um, yes, some of those people, that is their home, but uh, I've had four deaths in, in tents in 2023 and I did not overly enjoy taking those dead people out of those tents. When people are using drugs in encampments by themselves or with others, uh, there's little care for each other and we've had multiple events happen, uh, referencing violence, uh, a shooting, uh, and multiple stabbings. So we partnered with the city of Lethbridge and that has had a very positive impact in reducing the number of en encampments we've had. Uh, and this year we've we're involving the watch uh, with our encampment strategy to limit um, just kind of should share the information where the encampments are happening and try and get some of these people some supportive housing, get them into treatment, get them into some of the services that are readily available if they want to accept them or choose to be involved with them. That's currently what my unit looks like. There's not many of us. Uh, we're the like, officers and that you'll see within the downtown core out on bikes. And we have a couple of, of paddy wagons or the bigger vans that we see about. So we're hoping to have a few more members in the coming months as we've got some added staff being hired currently. So, yeah. That is the end of the PowerPoint. Great, thank you so much. So before we break into questions here, I just want to thank some of our supporters. So thank you to LSEO for providing this room free of charge, and thank you for everyone for patronizing, patronizing their lunch counter. Uh, a big thank you to the Lethbridge Herald and other media for their coverage and continued support. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support, as well as a big thank you to Rogers TV for recording our sessions, which today is Knut. Thank you. <laughs> um, so next week, our topic is how concerned are you about hearing loss? Sorry. Are you concerned about hearing loss and how it might affect your memory and thinking? as you age, with our speaker, Glenn Hoyle. Uh, Ryan, thank you for a very interesting presentation. My name is Ter Terry Shillington, and uh, if you mentioned it, I didn't catch it, but uh, would you address safe consumption sites? We've had quite a battle in the city over safe consumption sites, and the, the argument seemed to divide along political lines. I wonder, as a cop, how you feel about uh, safe consumption sites. I take this one. <coughs> that might just be easier. Okay. Oh, so supervised consumption sites, one hundred percent. Um, one hundred percent what? It is my belief, as a police officer who's worked in your downtown core for some time, uh, that there is a role for supervised consumption sites, as we currently have one parked in front of a shelter. It's a mobile one for opiate use. So opiate use, as we've just seen in a presentation, can lead to some fatal overdoses. Uh, if our population was just using opiates, we would have different problems. Unfortunately, uh, methamphetamine is the drug of choice. A lot of our users use methamphetamine and fentanyl together. When 
a lot of our supervised consumption sites are open and being used by a lot of our drug users. Um, like when the operation was going on First Avenue South, methamphetamine users were in there as well. So it made that place very busy and it took up a lot of the spots that would have been normally used for opiate users. So uh, I lived that whole time, I policed that area during that entire time. I have a strong understanding of what happened there. So yes, they do have a role within our society for opiate use, but there is no control for supervised consumption sites allowing people into their facility and what drug they're gonna use. They don't ask what drug they're using or they don't share or stop them if they're gonna be using meth. They welcome everyone in, which is a good thing. They should be welcoming everyone, not just certain people or drugs or you know age. So they're not being discriminatory in who they're allowing in. So yeah, I believe it does have a role within our society uh, for opiate use. Very, that's very much where my line is. So, uh, if anybody can under can control that or organize that, I welcome them to that challenge because uh, it's it's not easy. Because uh, yeah, a lot of like I mentioned before, a lot of good people have died within our, our city and across southern Alberta. So, thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, my name is Ian Hurdle. I actually have two questions. And one is, uh, besides the mental anguish the police and the emergency personnel have to go through, have any of the uh, forces been exposed to overdoses themselves by contact with the drugs? And the second one is, if there was a safe supply out there, do you think it would make things easier and take away the dollar value for dealers? First question, um, have we been exposed ourselves? Uh, we've had a couple, um, we've had a couple of instances where we've had opiates entering our own bodies. One, I had a fentanyl meter go through my finger. It was full of fentanyl, which the EMS guys were great to come and help me with that. Uh, we've had multiple times where we physically touched something uh, that had fentanyl on it and you get that some numbness in your hand, uh, which is a little bit scary. We have not had any of our members go down into a full overdose state, uh, so we've been lucky in that. So if we, anytime we're dealing with fentanyl, especially out in, in the public, and it can be windy, like if someone has a bunch of fentanyl, which can be granular, in a car, and in our lovely city, you know that if you open up both sides of a car, it could blow through. Uh, we've had a couple times where fentanyl is literally blown in an officer's face or a fireman or EMS member's face, which is super frustrating. So we just got to be aware of our surroundings. And <clears throat> so our second question was safe supply. safe supply. I just had the honor of spending a day with Vancouver Police Departments uh, back in February. Uh, I saw what they're dealing with in downtown Vancouver. Uh, I am, you're not going to see me supporting that theory. Uh, I think they have shown that that has not been successful across the beautiful pro province of British Columbia, and hence why they're dealing with a massive problem. Uh, from talking with those police officers that deal with that on the front lines there, yeah, everyone's using it. They go and get their safe supply every single couple days or every day and it goes straight out the window because it gets sold and they take that dollar and sell fentanyl. So yeah, I, I guess it may reduce an angle of property crime, but you're also increasing um, your drug using population. And I, I have kids, I live in a city. Uh, I don't want to live in a world where it's socially acceptable or cool to use fentanyl or methamphetamine. And if we make that type of use socially acceptable and readily available, um, yeah, that's a road I don't want to go down because uh, I want my kids. Yeah. Hi, my name is Henning Mundell. And uh, you made brief mention of Narcan. My question is about treatment and reversal. So Narcan and Naloxone uh, to assist uh, um, yeah, opioid um addicts and um consumers but is there something that it, for the methamphetamines what treatment do you have for that 
if someone is overdosing on fentanyl, we can give them nasal Narcan or we can administer uh, like a needle portion. So we do that in conjunction with CPR on those people. Uh, I've had the joy of going through 39 of those events where I've come across someone who I thought was for sure dead. Uh, and we brought them back. It's an amazing drug, and we saved a lot of lives across Western Canada with that. For methamphetamine users, um, I compare it to an engine. <clears throat> when you buy a brand new car um, and you rev the engine a little bit, um, you're not going to hurt it. For methamphetamine users, it increases their heart rates, um, they are physically moving more, they're not sleeping. Uh, imagine flooring the engine of a car, it's only going to last so long, right? So we see the fallout for methamphetamine use with other body problems. You can't officially overdose from methamphetamine. Uh, they can get into cardiac arrest, like a heart attack, uh, if the heart goes too fast. But I'm not gonna delve into the medical portion of that. I'm nowhere near a doctor, I'm barely a cop. So uh, yeah, that's kind of where that piece comes together. We, you, we, for the most part, if we have someone who is an extreme case and they're flailing around and they're not um, safe for themselves or everyone around them, like if they're like stumbling on a roadway and not listening to commands, we can detain them um, for like disturbing the peace and we can you know arrest them. We get EMS there, they can sedate them. Uh, but at that point, you're into a medical call. So we'll take them to the hospital, I'll sedate them, I'll get them some fluids, I'll get them kind of back to baseline, uh, but then they're released as soon as they would like to leave the hospital. So that's kind of at the back end of all of this is with our drug crisis, it puts massive strain on our health, our health um, pieces within the ER. Uh, it gets frustrating when we go into the emergency room uh, with a patient that we were bringing in for like a mental health assessment and we see a lineup of our drug users who are in overdose states or being sedated for methamphetamine use, uh, it just clogs up that system. So uh, solving our drug crisis would massively help our brothers and sisters and our brother health services too. So. Thank you very much. My name is Kathy Johnson Campbell. I'm wondering how many dealers do you pick up maybe in a month and what happens to them? We are probably laying a possession for the purpose of trafficking charge every day or two. So it's, it's a regular occurrence for us to arrest people that are involved in the sale of drugs. Uh, that's primarily our crime suppression team, which is a covert unit, which their main task is dealing with, with drug users and dealers and violence and that. Uh, we have priority crimes and other covert units like uh, they deal with property crimes. Uh, and then we have a lurch in the southern zone here, so they uh, operate undercover operations, you know, they'll go on the street and buy drugs. So it's a regular thing for us to, to arrest someone for with possession purpose of trafficking. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get a say in it whether they get held in custody. So most of these people get bail and then they get released and then they get arrested again for the similar offenses. And that's just kind of the cadence of how that goes. At some point, hopefully, they get held in custody. But I just show up every day and we try our very best to, to stop what's happening in our community. I don't really check on kind of who gets what jail time. Um, I'm kind of past that as it, it would uh, frustrate me too much, so. So my name is Mark Gatto. That's sort of the question I had, but my question is how often do you see them back on the street at the people that you've arrested and how long since you've arrested them do you see them back uh, dealing again? It, it can be within days or hours. It depends what the offense is. Our bail process, so if you're arrested for something very bad, like possession of the purpose of trafficking, you would have to go through a bail hearing, which means you come to the police station. We would have to take you into our cell block. You're there for eight to 24 hours uh, and most likely get released with things you can and cannot do, like can't go to a certain area, you might have a curfew, all that kind of stuff. And then we have some other officers where their main task is to follow up and confirm that everyone is following along with their conditions that are in place. Uh, and now we have a new program called CompStat, which is more information sharing with other police officers of our habitual offenders of, you know, put more pressure on them, so. 
Great, I have a, a question about, um, so folks say that they're afraid to go downtown. And, you know, we put that playground there and, you know, have more, more folks participating in that area. What do you say mm -hmm. to people who, you know, say they're afraid to go in downtown? Do you see it changing in the future? And what might be some solutions? I will be honest. When I first heard the idea of the playground, I was a little bit skeptical. But it's been an awesome addition. It's, we've seen families, kids playing there in the afternoon, in the morning. People come downtown for a doctor's appointment or, um, you know, getting their hair done. It's catwalk nearby. And you see kids out playing there with their, their mom or dad. Uh, and even with my at-risk population. So last week, there was a group of about 20 little people who were like kindergarten age and an organization had brought them there and they were walking around and making sure they were safe of course um, and a lot of even my users were sitting on a bench and we had a chat and they said it's really just nice to hear kids playing because a lot of our people downtown they have kids uh, and they wish they could be around them but they're addicted to drugs and they're not able to so uh, I, I had never really thought of that point uh, and they even walk in with her like, this is great. Uh, I think that playground gets treated with respect. I have not had a, a negative event involving that playground. I haven't had anybody damaging it or leaving debris on it. It gets treated with as, as a bit of a no-go zone. Uh, and in the summertime, when we get the fountain going along with the, with the playground, that's going to be awesome. Like, it's just a good positive area. And when, anytime I have positive events or positive users in my downtown core, it pushes everybody away. Like, uh, the, their negative users don't want to be around happy people. So, yeah. Um, and in downtown as a whole, um, I guess I see downtown a little bit different. Um, I'm a little more probably confident in being in more negative situations too. But there's a lot of really good people who, who live downtown and spend a lot of time downtown who argue that point all the time saying, hey, I always feel safe. Everybody has a different feeling of what is safe, though. Um, depending on what your life experience has been, uh, where you live, what you've gone through. So, yeah. Uh, I, I still feel comfortable feeling, saying that it's safe. Uh, we have a lot of people coming and going to the downtown core, to the mall, to a lot of our downtown businesses uh, on a daily basis, which don't have problems. So. Thank you very much, Ryan, for your presentation. Uh, my question relates to supply. Every once in a while you hear about a massive uh, catch of supply being intercepted, but it doesn't seem to affect the supply on the street. Uh, do you have any insight to how that is? Well, where is all that supply? How is it getting here? And, uh, yeah, and that, do you have any insight to that? So we've started to see an increase in drugs like fentanyl and methamphetamine coming from, from Mexico. Uh, primarily fentanyl was coming from China before, which has made it more difficult because of some of the cartels are getting involved. Uh, there's a lot more money to be made in the sale of methamphetamine and fentanyl especially compared to cocaine. Cocaine is still expensive to produce and make on the back end of it, uh, whereas fentanyl is made in a lab, right? So there's a huge profit margin, and organized crime is all over that uh, in Western Canada, for sure. Um, I would say when we do have a big bust, like when our crime suppression team picks off one of our bigger dealers and they get a kilogram of fentanyl, we for sure see that follow for the following days, weeks, where prices will spike because there's not much drug supply in the city uh, and within time that uh, drug supply gets picked up by another dealer who brings drugs in so we're always trying to tackle those dealers uh, and we just keep going on that so uh, graham greenley is my name apparently uh, alberta has um, uh, rat patrol along the alberta saskatchewan border to prevent rats from getting into the province. Would it be possible to have uh, drug patrols 
along the borders to keep uh, drugs from getting into the province? I wish it was that simple. Uh, and I would apply for that job if that was okay. Yeah, that's, uh, it was, unfortunately these people are using planes, trains, and automobiles to get their drug supply into our awesome province, so it's, it's, it's a monumental task, so. Thank you, Terry Shillington. I have a second question. I wonder if we could ask you to do some Thank you. I wonder if we could ask you to do some dreaming about what needs to be done. You know, some people think, and I think we're going to have a political discussion about this, I gather, in the coming months and weeks. Um, some people think legalization of drugs is, is the solution to that. Um, somebody said to me, uh, why don't you force people into treatment? Uh, step out of your, your cop shoes for a second, maybe. And uh, what would you like to see happen around, what would be a, a, a solution around this, rather than just pulling bodies out of the river, sort of, why are they, why are they landing up in the river? And what can we do about it? Well, I think when we talk about lepers specifically, I think we're in a good position currently. Well, sorry, when I look into the future. So we have a, a massive facility breaking ground any day now at 416 Stafford Drive North, which is a permanent supportive housing facility, which is going to be operated by Lethbridge Housing Authority. Uh, the funds are already in place for that. Um, it's going ahead. It's going to house, I think, about 30 people uh, with full-time wraparound services, uh, counseling, supports, guest management. They're not going to be allowed to have different people in their room. There's going to be some medical attention on the main floor. There's a cafeteria. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we take some of that population out of our shelter, get them into a place like that, um, along with detox and uh, treatment after the fact. Um, I think that we'll start to see a diminishing number of people within our downtown core or within our at-risk population. So we have that facility moving in. We have Streets Alive opening a large new facility up near the shelter in the old El Dorado building, uh, which is going to increase some, some supports up there, uh, so get some meaningful day, daily activities uh, to just get some of our at-risk population busy during the day, get them reconnected, and hope, hopefully get them into detox and um, treatment. As for the long term, um, I can't really speak about detaining people who are using drugs. Um, I have a long list of fantastic human beings that I have put into jail for a long time who came back to me after the fact and said, hey, thank you. Um, it's really weird when I'm standing in golf gardens and some random person comes up and hugs me and says, hey, you saved my life because you put me in jail. And they're like, I hated you at that time, but I got clean, I got better, I went to treatment, and now I have my kids back. So those are good moments. I, there's some wins like that. So getting people off the drugs and getting their, their back to who they really are is the, is the main piece of that, which is detox and treatment close together. So more supports like that, like Fresh Start, awesome, fantastic organization that is operating our big new um, treatment facility just east of the city. Uh, so we're lucky to have a, a piece like that very, very close to us. So, uh, and I think our provincial government is in the middle of building several different facilities across southern Alberta. It just takes time to get them built and get them staffed with the proper people who want to be there for the right reasons too. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Beth Mundell Atherstone. A uh, couple of questions for you. You talked about the airsoft gun. I think that's the one you're taking off the streets daily. Can you tell us more about that and about the bullets and what it does? And I'm quite curious too about the demographics of the unhoused and the housed, so people who are not on the streets, who you're seeing um, um, taking drugs, having to be revived from overdoses. Can you give us a little bit of a breakdown of that, of age, gender, what they look like, um, who's dying, and that kind of thing? Thank you so much. And sorry, what was the first question? The soft. 
Our airsoft and or pellet guns can be purchased at Canadian Tire or in multiple different businesses across the city. Um, they shoot a little pellet that makes a popping noise, like it sounds almost like a gun. Um, we had, funny enough, one of our uh, a very troubled individual who was being arrested by our tactical team. He uh, jumped on a bike, got out of their inner containment, and actually got arrested in the field behind here. Uh, he was struck with a, a police vehicle and he got up and ran even after that. One of our officers was chasing behind him and he took the pellet gun back and shot at our officer. Uh, it was rush hour at that time and that police officer had his service firearm out. Uh, could have shot him because he thought he was being shot. He felt the impacts on his legs and didn't shoot that individual because the backdrop at that point was 6th Avenue uh, during rush hour, which there was multiple cars going past and his brain thought, if I miss, I could hurt somebody. So I'm just gonna take my wounded self and he walked to the side and got behind cover thinking he'd been shot and then found it was just uh, pellet guns. So they're readily available, they're out there. Uh, it's frustrating that we see those every single day. And like I mentioned before, I'm just thankful that no one has lost their life from the use of those. Um, but they're used every day to like, intimidate drug dealers. A lot of our users have them. They'll rob people on the streets. They'll you know, go into a 7-Eleven at 3 o'clock in the morning and try and, and rob them as well. So they are prevalent. I'm sorry. When it comes to our at-risk population or who's, who's being revived, overdoses, it's, man, it's everywhere. It is, we've had a few youths pass away in the past three or four months, which is super troubling, especially when they're in that 14, 15 range. Uh, that's really young. Um, it goes all the way up into probably the early 40s. Um, but we see people who are couch surfing. We see people who are like at risk population downtown. I would say the majority of our overdoses uh, within the city of Lethbridge, the ones that are deaths, uh, happen inside residences. And that information is also on the NHS website where it references like inside a hotel, a motel, uh, or someone's um, residence. So people are just using by themselves. Uh, they may get some money from someone or from some support. They go rent a hotel room and they use drugs by themselves. So. Uh, and as for what race, uh, it's, it's all over the place. It's everything under the sun, like we're all people, so. Hi, my name is Doug Neal. <coughs> and I was very interested to hear you say that people uh, that you've put in jail have come out very good. Uh, we've had a problem where I've lived uh, where we've had drug problems, drug house next door, police has been there every week, uh, drug in the house on the other side. Uh, they get arrested and it seems the jail has a revolving door on them because I see more of them than I deal with my own wife. <laughs> I think I embellished a little bit there. <clears throat> but uh, how do you keep them in jail if jail does good things? <clears throat> well, I don't get to make that choice when it comes to sentencing. And my personal experiences with people that have come out uh, maybe that's my own personal experience as a police officer. Um, I'm sure there's been hundreds or thousands of people that I put in that facility that didn't come out and give me a hug after. So, um, yeah, I can't speak to sentencing. That's a lot of that is federal decisions that get made for, uh, I think we're, our federal government's moving in a direction of less penalties, more moral support instead of getting people, you know, giving them significant time in jail for, for horrendous crimes, so, yeah. 
Hi, Leona Jacobs. Thank you for this talk. It's been enlightening. I'm reading Demon Copperhead right now by Black King Solver, and it's all about getting and becoming a druggie, basically. Um, my question has to do with you and your peeps, and how do you decompress from this, these experiences that you're undergoing? Well, uh, I'll reference uh, about two and a half years ago, three years ago, we hired a new deputy chief who was an RCP officer. His name is Joe Grobmeyer. He's currently our deputy chief, and his mantra coming from the RCP is employee wellness. So he's really pushed our mental health wellness to be aware of that. We've hired a mental health, or sorry, a wellness coordinator um, to get us some more supports uh, and just honestly talking about it. Like, I'm 45, and when I first started policing, we didn't talk about how we felt. Like, we would go to um, horrendous events, people dying, car collisions, bad things happening, young people, and after work, we would maybe go for a beer and go home. Uh, and now, we go to those events, and we come back to the police station, uh, and we will sit down and just like you check in, like, are you okay? Uh, like that was super messed up that we just went to and that we saw that. And we'll just talk about it. And I think talking about it and having that more open conversation with each other is really important. And I know especially with my junior members that I work with, like you you can see it on them and it's super tough. Uh, and it's, I think we're, we're okay saying that we can take you know, some time away from work so we do see a little bit more time off on stress sleep, but that's okay because we get those people back compared to keeping everything up inside of them uh, for years or months and then they break and then they're off for you know years at a time. So I think we've gotten better at that. Like it's okay to be screwed up. Like and that's okay. Like I joke about it, but I I'm not normal. I like the way my brain works, um, and that's okay. So my name is Kurt Peterson. Uh, Ryan could you uh, tell us a little bit about, is cannabis uh, still an issue, like back in your days? Uh, where are we at with cannabis now? Now that it's legal, we, like we used to have some problems for sure. We, it was a, we had arrest people for cannabis possession, whatever. Uh, we're past that. Uh, honestly, we don't see a whole lot of problems. Like I, I was just walking through the park the other day and these two guys were sitting there and they're one's playing guitar and they're laughing and they're smoking marijuana. And they're like, are we getting in trouble for this? And I'm like, I wish everyone in my downtown just smoked marijuana. <laughs> it's, yeah, we, we don't see a whole lot of calls for service or issues or violence or problems for sure. It's, it's well controlled. I think the government's done an okay job of managing it. Uh, impaired driving by drug is a different thing, um, but I, I'm no expert on that, so I don't really want to speak on that. Beth Mitchell Atherstone again. With all the information you've given us today, I'm wondering, do you share this kind of information with the schools, especially junior and senior high? If you were to ask my daughters, they're gonna say yes, because they're tired of hearing about how bad drugs are. Um, it's, it's an information piece that we push out for sure. Uh, recently, the city of Lethbridge got some federal funding for building safer communities fund. So they've hired some caseworkers and some educators. We're going to be start to, starting to push out, you know, negative behaviors, gang lifestyle, how to stay away from that stuff, and drug use as part of that. So for sure, that's something that's coming. So we currently don't have a whole lot of school resource officers because we're so short uh, staffed at this point. So once again, if you know anybody, we're hiring. I'm right here. You're hired. Please go in front of it. I have a general question about community safety because it seems to be a general concern for a lot of people. And some larger cities have community safety patrols and organizations. What are your thoughts on that? They can be valuable. Like what I ask of everyone is just be a good witness. Like you probably are gonna see some things around our city that are gonna be troublesome. If you, some, see, if you think that something is odd or out of place, 
Uh, you're welcome to call our complaint sign at 328-444-4444. And that's the only way I remember it. <laughs> but if you're seeing something, you get that feeling, you go, that's just not right. Like that car looks out of place, or it's, it's left parked weird or wrong direction in your neighborhood. It's been there for a week. Um, give us a call so we can come by and take a look at it. If you're seeing things that are unfolding dynamically, like a violent offense or somebody with a weapon, just be a really good witness. Like that's all I need you to do. Uh, me and my friends are well trained, we know what we're doing, and I think we were very comfortable with violence. Um, we just like get a great description that like the gentleman was, was six foot seven and he had a head the size of a balloon and he had blue pants on with a red stripe on. Just just get a really good description because that's the, the main piece that we're looking for. When we show up to these events, we just want to know what did the person look like, which way did they go, what were they doing, did they have a machete in their hand, you know, things like that. So, yeah, help set us up for success too, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Sergeant Dara. And before I give him the last word, I just want to remind folks that we do have our donation jars on the table. I forgot to mention that prior to passing the question. So thank you so much for your support uh, over the season. We really, really appreciate it. And before we give a big clap for, for Ryan, we'll just give him the last word here and thank him so much for his time. Uh, thank you for having me, number one. Um, it's nice to be surrounded with people who support us, which I appreciate. I know you're all busy and you take your time to, to share your hour with me. Was anyone offended? No. no. Okay. Um, like I, I had a different delivery um, with some of this stuff, but I, I kind of put a light spin on it because it is, it's is—it's a bit of a negative uh, topic, which it's kind of be, can be a little bit heavy. And I, I very much appreciate your question about our people. Uh, and I appreciate you thinking about us. So thank you.